we had this attack on Alexa Hospital, people were burning alive, Scott. What's your take on the latest news that Biden administration is putting out? Well, I mean, it's it's a step in the right direction, but it's too late. I mean, um, it's not going to save the family that burned to death in front of everybody alive. Uh, it's not going to save the 40 to 180,000 Palestinians who have lost their lives so far in the ongoing genocide being waged by Israel against uh, the people of Gaza. Um, it's not going to save the thousands of people who have perished in Beirut uh, because of the collective punishment policies of Israel. Um, all of these are war crimes. So we're going to coddle a war crime, you know, a nation committee war crimes for 30 more days. Um, uh, this is meaningless, um, to be honest, because Israel will now manipulate um, the situation. All it's going to take is one Israeli attack against uh, Iran and an Iranian retaliation. The United States won't be talking about not sending weapons to Israel. They'll be pouring weapons into Israel. So, you know, I believe it when the United States said, um, you know, we're going to withdraw the FAD system or we won't deploy it to begin with. We'll withdraw naval ships. Uh, we'll, we'll withdraw American troops from the region. Um, we're going to leave you defenseless because we can't defend uh, a nation that carries out these acts. Why 30 days? Why not uh, Why not 24 hours? Why not 48 hours? Why not, you know, something that means something? This is a meaningless gesture, meaningless gesture on the eve of a national election. Um, and that's what the 30 days is uh, because they can't take uh, this kind of bold action now because there will be political consequences domestically. And so it's it's one of these things where the Biden administration is trying to have its cake and eat it too, where they're going to talk about doing something that should have been done a long time ago, uh, 30 days out. No, I, um, this is just politics. I, I'll believe it when I see it. How do you think that the way that they're trying to, to, to attack, they're, they're attacking Gazans right now. And the way that they're keeping this conflict with Lebanon and with Iran is to distract people from what's going on in Gaza? Uh, it's, it's about keeping Benjamin Netanyahu politically relevant. Um, he can only remain in power if he's seen as the national security prime minister, and you can only make national security your top priority if you are engage in conflicts that um, are seen as promoting the um, existential survival of Israel. Uh, Gaza is a losing conflict. If you focus solely on Gaza, um, he would not be able to stay in power. So he's expanded the conflict into Lebanon, and now he's going to expand the conflict into, uh, into Iran. Um, all in an effort to, uh, to achieve what he's wanted from day one, which is to get the United States involved in military actions against uh, against Iran. So, you know, that, that's what's going on here. It's not, um, it, it really comes down to just Benjamin Netanyahu. And how about this new attack of Hezbollah on Israel, this drone attack? It seems that their system, their air defense system didn't work. And do they, are they really now concerned about what would happen in, in the coming days, in in next week, in, in next month, in this conflict with Lebanese people? Well, the Israelis have, uh, you know, fooled themselves into a false sense of complacency because of their, um, the trick plays that they ran, the exploding pagers, um, the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, um, the assassination or the elimination of, um, you know, a significant chunk of uh, the Hezbollah leadership. Um, they, they started declaring victory uh, too early. Uh, Hezbollah is a resistance-based organization. It has recovered, and it will, con you know, and now we see that it's able to ratchet up the pressure on Israel. Netanyahu had uh, an impossible mission. He said that he's going to return sixty thousand people to uh, the northern settlements. How's that working out, Ben? Uh, you know, Bibi, uh, Bubba, <laughs> you, you you able to do that? No. Hezbollah will keep uh, the northern Israel shut down, and now they're talking about continuing to expand their operations. Um, and they'll keep going further south and further south and further south until Hezbollah starts hitting Tel Aviv on a regular basis. And um, that's the reality of Israel. They'll never be able to, to, to stop this from happening. Um, their only hope is to have a uh, conflict termination. There can't be conflict termination until they're ready and willing to resolve uh, the Gaza situation, which, again, the United States 
you know, had we put, um, you know, 48 or 72 hour, um, you know, time window on the threat to stop weapon shifts, shipments, um, you know, this is, this would be, you know, pressure being placed across the board at the same time and you could achieve results. But Netanyahu um, is a political snake and he will, uh, he will, you know, squirm his way through and, um, and find gaps. And I, I think the next thing you're going to see is that Israel is going to attack uh, Iran and uh, this will generate a, a wider regional conflict, um, which again will distract from the ongoing failures that are taking place in Gaza. Um, and will also put political pressure on the United States uh, to make it impossible for us to stop sending weapons to Israel. And two things that in the Russian media they were talking about, one of them was these drones coming to Israel were made of composites, and it seems that it's so difficult for the air defense system to recognize them, to track them. And what's your take on this? these type of drones that Hezbollah is using against Israel? Well, I mean, again, I don't know the, I mean, I, I hear the reports. Um, I haven't seen the drones. I'm not in a position to see the drones, and so I can't do a forensic uh, evaluation of them. Um, I also don't know the uh, the parameters uh, associated with the flight path. Um, you know, what was the altitude? Was it doing terrain masking? Uh, is there more than just the composites? Uh, what is what is the configuration of the drone? Because I don't care if you have composites. Uh, you know, if your if your drone is built um, in a certain manner where it has reflective services, um, you know, you're still going to be able to detect it. So. You know, I think there is a combination of factors. I don't think Hezbollah has built a stealth drone. I think Hezbollah has built a low observable drone, which uh, when it uh, utilizes certain tactics can exploit existing gaps in the Israeli air defense umbrella to hit targets um, in Israel. And, you know, the, the other reality is that um, there might be some other things at play here where the Iron Dome, because they're running out of missiles, um, you know, may have been deliberately dumbed down by Israel to prevent them from, you know, shooting missiles off and Hezbollah is taking advantage of this. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into the success that Hezbollah is enjoying right now uh, than just to come out and say, you know, Israel's defense shield doesn't work. We know at one time it, it, it did function, but, uh, you know, it's, we're more than a year into a war where Israel has relied heavily on the Iron Dome and uh, recently on Arrow and David Sling and other systems. Um, and both Hezbollah and Iran have collected the intelligence. Um, so have the Houthi, the Ansarallah, and they uh, they adapt uh, their their operations based upon this new intelligence. And as we see, they're having um, increasing success in penetrating the Israeli defense shields. It seems that right now, with this new system going to Israel, this called thought air defense system, it's a kinetic weapon which means it doesn't have a warhead. It has to hit the target to just explode it. And do you think that two things, what would be the message from the United States to Israel and Iran in terms of this air defense system? It's, it cannot be used as offensive, isn't it? No, I can't. It's and a defensive system. Is a defensive system, but it's totally different from Patriot system that we know that it has a warhead. Well, it, it you're talking about you know the the methods of engagement. Um, the that is a kinetic system, but it's still guided by radar to the target. Um, the uh, it's also designed to. Um, intercept at different altitudes. This is meant to get, um, you know, missiles uh, higher, higher up in the atmosphere. Um, the Patriot gets them on their descent. Uh, the THAAD can, can get them in the mid range. Um, the thing about the THAAD is you, you call it a new system. It's not that new. Uh, it's been around for a while. Um, and like most systems, uh, you know, it underwent, um, you know, a decade or more of development, um, uh, so this is old technology. It's not cutting edge technology. It's old technology. Um, and when you do proof of concept uh, testing, um, 
you know, first of all, you want the test to succeed. And so oftentimes it's, uh, you know, the THAAD was used against uh, very predictable targets. Indeed, in some cases, THAAD and other uh, systems, you know, in order to get the result they want, there's a little bit of cheating that takes place. For instance, uh, they might do something that's, that allows the, the, the system, the, the, the incoming target to be tracked earlier and do something to increase the, the uh, reflective nature of the target so that, you know, you can get this, uh, you know, bullet hitting a bullet kind of result. Um, and, the, and again, they did this years ago. The FAD has never been tested in combat against modern missiles, um, <laughs> hypersonic missiles. It, it, it can't intercept a hypersonic missile. It can't intercept a hypersonic missile with a separating maneuverable warhead. It can't intercept a normal ballistic missile with a separating maneuvering warhead. Um, and it definitely can't defend against a saturation attack, a salvo attack like the Iranians have uh, shown themselves capable of doing, you know, putting 32 missiles, 40 missiles in the air against the target coming in at the same time. Um, the, 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 the FAD system, like the Israeli systems before, it will be overwhelmed and, um, you know, and, 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 and totally ineffective. So that is a political gesture by the United States to say, here, we're doing something to, uh, to protect you. Uh, but what I think we're protecting is Novatim Air Base because that's the air base that's used as the primary entry point for the American weapons shipments. Now, maybe we won't need that in 30 days if we stop sending weapons into uh, Israel. But in the meantime, the deployment of FAD shows that the United States is very much intent on convincing the Israelis that if there is a conflict that ha involves a ballistic missile threat to Israel, that the United States will do its best to um, to keep to keep Novatim airfield open. And the other thing in the Russian media they were talking about, about Lebanon, they said that it would be a huge defeat for Israel to go underground. From what we've seen so far, how did you find their operation on the ground in Lebanon? Well, they haven't gone in very far, have they? I mean... <laughs> Let's predict. Let's let's take a look at the outcome um, when when they conclude. The purpose of this of you know, of this uh, attack is to drive Hezbollah north of the Latani River. Um, they're not even close to accomplishing that. Uh, Hezbollah has withdrawn from its forward uh, areas uh, to consolidate their their power um, to draw Israel in. Remember, every kilometer Israel goes in is a kilometer more that. Uh, they have to resupply over in difficult terrain, exposing lines of communication to interdiction, um, compelling the Israelis to push forward their uh, logistical support points inside uh, Israel, exposing them to attack by drones and missiles. Um, you know, and, and now we see as Israel does start to punch in, you know, Hezbollah fights back. There's been some videos coming out of uh, sharp engagements where Israel has not been able to continue their advance and they've been pushed back. And if Israel wants to continue moving in, then the number of casualties will ex will, will expand exponentially. Israel has not been in a hard fight yet. There are some skirmishes, some tough skirmishes, but for the most part, Israel's punching into an empty bag. Um, but at some point in time, uh, the Israeli fist is going to meet the Hamas wall and, um, you know, and we'll see it. Uh, but, you know, I think it's grossly irresponsible and, and unrealistic to sit here and, and, and try to, you know, predict an Israeli victory based upon, you know, the results that have taken place so far. Um, this is not an Israeli victory, far from it. Yeah, last time, I think the, the other time that we talked on October 1st, that we were talking at the same time Iranians were attacking Israel, if you remember that day. And right now it seems that Israelis are getting prepared to attack Iran. Do you think that they're going to attack Iran? Because recently we had a an article in if I'm not mistaken, Washington Post, they're talking about that Israelis would not attack the nuclear facilities, the, the oil facilities in Iran. And on the other hand, today, the, the, the Gallant was talking about the Israeli Minister of Defense, Gallant, said that their attack on Iran would influence, would affect the countries in the region. What does it mean when you put these two messages together 
I don't know. I mean, the Israelis are doing a lot of posturing right now, and much of that is for political purposes. Um, the United States, um, Israel has to be careful because if, for instance, it strikes Iranian oil targets, um, the Iranian response will be to shut down Middle East oil production, shut down the Strait of Hormuz, and throw the global economy into you know absolute paralysis. Uh, the American economy on the eve of an election will be spinning out of control, will be devastating for the Biden administration and uh, you know uh, the Harris candidacy. Um, and if Israel thinks that it can do this and not pay a price, I, I think they're they're wrong. Um, and I think the Biden administration is trying to impart that on. So you've heard from the Israelis, OK, we won't hit oil targets. Um, then you've you've seen them um, say, well, you're going to hit nuclear targets. That's been their fantasy. Well, they can't hit nuclear targets. We'll just start off with the reality that the, the most important nuclear targets in the Tons and Ferdos are underground. And so uh, especially Ferdos would require uh, the use of nuclear weapons to uh, to destroy it. And that would require Israel to, you know, basically end its uh, you know policy of deliberate ambiguity and acknowledge we are a nuclear power and that we have used nuclear weapons uh, preemptively. Um, this would trigger um, Iran's withdrawal from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the rapid uh, development of a nuclear weapons capability that would be used in retaliation against Israel and destroy Israel. Um, it has the potential of you know, bringing in Russia and the United States as well. So the United States has said, we don't want you to go down this path as, as well. So this leaves Israel with doing a uh, retaliation uh, that will strike um, military targets, leadership targets, um, you know, maybe some non-oil and gas producing infrastructure targets. Um, but Iran has said, if you do this, we will hit you uh, with a saturation attack, a thousand missiles, maybe 2000 missiles coming in and taking out Israel's uh, infrastructure itself. Um, and maybe Israel's willing to risk all this in the hopes of dragging the United States into a um, into a larger conflict. But uh, to sit there and, and talk about you know, the region as well, look, Saudi Arabia, you know, made peace with Iran, the rapprochement. Um, and many other nations are willing to um, live with Iran because they believe, you know, that Iran is a regional power uh, with, you know, um, significant military capabilities that can can no longer be intimidated. And that rather than continuing to go down the path of, you know, forceful containment, that maybe the best path is to learn how to peacefully coexist. Um, and I think the Israeli attack would uh, is designed to demonstrate to the nations of the region that Iran is not a power, a superpower that is very vulnerable to attack and that um, the nation should reevaluate their uh, their stance vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, I think the Israelis would also seek to simultaneously um, engender some sort of domestic unrest similar to what happened in 2023 and the aftermath of the uh, death of that uh, Iranian girl that died in police custody because of the hijab violation. Um, you know, but the, you know, this is all rhetoric. I mean, we have to see what uh, what Israel can do. Uh, hitting Iran is a very difficult proposition. Uh, Iran is a long way away. There will be the need for refueling. Uh, there will be the need to uh, be able to overcome Iran's, um, you know, air defense system. Israel's never attempted something like this before. Um, you know, Russia may be involved, uh, both in terms of manning uh, and directing uh, S-400 uh, missile batteries, uh, but also uh, maybe piloting uh, Su-35 interceptor aircraft, maybe integrating their uh, their their own AWACS uh, aircraft, uh, which can take off and fly a profile over the Caspian Sea to detect uh, any incoming F-35s, F-22s, F-15Is, and uh, vector Iranian air defense uh, to them. Um, there's no guarantee that Israel is going to be able to pull this off. It's a very, very difficult proposition. So I, 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 I hear a lot of rhetoric coming out of Israel, um, but trying to transform that rhetoric into reality is, uh, is it's a tall order. Don't you think that putting a hundred American soldiers in Israel with this new air defense system would complicate the situation between Iran and Israel, even in the United States? No. First of all, Iran doesn't need to target it. 
uh, Iran will be able to hit all the sites it wants to hit. There's only 48 interceptors in the THAAD system. If Iran fires a thousand missiles and all 48 hit, and I'm not much of a mathematician, but that uh, leads me to believe there'd be 952 missiles that are still inbound. And if Iran follows up with another salvo of a thousand missiles, it, it, the THAAD becomes a totally irrelevant system, easily saturated, easily defeated. Um, and again, it's it's not you know new. This is older technology. Um, it, it's technology that has its roots in the you know technology of the '70s and the methodologies of the '70s, uh, as opposed to something new that just came out of a, you know the American uh, defense industry um, you know brain trust. So the Thad's not going to be a game changer. It's not going to do anything. It's it's more of a political statement saying we are here. Um, it's also, to be frank, it's part of the standard force protection package. If we're going to uh, be, you know, because we have Americans, there was like 100 Americans to be deployed to Israel full time. We already have Americans deployed to Israel full time. We have a large number of logisticians, uh, you know, cargo handlers that are, you know, living and operating in Nevatim and other airfields to receive uh, incoming American aircraft and offload them. Um, you know, so, you know, we, we already have Americans in harm's way. This this is just a standard force protection package that's put in uh, when Americans could find themselves potentially in the middle of a, of a conflict. The threat is identified as missiles. Therefore, the counter to the threat will be an anti-missile capability. THAAD is one of the most advanced anti-missile capabilities the United States possesses. So we're deploying it, but it's not going to change anything. Do you think that what was the, the question is many people are asking what was the necessity of Israel receiving this new air defense system, this THAAD, the air defense system from the United States? Is that related to what has happened to Nevadam Air Base during that attack, that Iranian attack? Did they destroy any air defense system that Israelis wanted to replace it, or it's an additional aid to Israel? Well, again, we don't know the full um, extent of the damage done by the Iranian missiles. We do know that there were 32 separate impact points on the bottom. Um, we also know that, um, you know, some missiles came in and hit targets that the Iranians say are related to Arrow 2 and Arrow 3 uh, systems, that these uh, impacts took place before um, the um, air raid sirens came off, indicating perhaps uh, hypersonic capabilities. Um, you know, so the, 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 the fact of the matter is the, the Israelis don't have an air defense system that works, um, to, to integrate THAAD is, uh, it's been tested, as I said, in, uh, I think 2019, THAAD was brought in and, um, they did the integration test that, you know, you have a different kind of radar that's collecting data. How do you integrate that data into the overall data collection that's taking place inclusive of American overhead satellites, um, the Aegis ships that are parked off the coast of the Mediterranean and along down the Red Sea, their 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 radar. So you have to find a way to plug in this radar data to integrate it in. So they've already tested it. So the FAT is literally at this point in time a plug-in plug-out system. Uh, they they it was deployed in October, integrated. So uh, it's not as though the the FAT is you know is going to radically change anything. It's going to plug in and add its capabilities. Now, you know, the, 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 the 48 interceptors have different intercept uh, parameters, uh, profiles that'll be factored in. So as a threat comes in, your battle management is going to detect um, and, and direct uh, intercepts to take place. The, um, I think it's an S-band radar, but I could be wrong. Maybe an X-band radar on the uh, on the FAD. It's going to intercept at a at a further rate. It's going to be able to direct. So the FAD is going to add a certain element of intercept capability uh, to to the system. Um, you know, and then you have to deconflict. I mean, um, you know, what's David Sling doing? Uh, if FAD's going to take over this sector, what's you know where's David Singh? You don't want them being overlapping uh, sectors because that's a waste of resources. You don't want to be firing FAD and David Sling at the same target. So there's deconfliction that has to take place. This has all been factored in, um, and again, the the Iranians 
aren't worried about this. I, I really don't think, first of all, the Iranians are smart. Um, I, I don't know the Iranian battle plan. I don't know, you know, what their thinking is, but I do know this. These are very smart people who are smarter than I am on these issues. And I know how I would plan an attack and the factors that I would put into it. And I'm confident that based upon the plan I could come up with, that I can easily overwhelm every aspect of the Israeli-American air defense umbrella that's been put up there, that it will not stop a concerted attack. And if Scott Ritter can do that thousands of miles removed sitting in his, uh, in, in his office at home, uh, I think Iranians who are possessed far better intelligence, um, who know the full capabilities of their systems um, and have designed their systems. Remember, some of these are newer weapons that have been designed specifically for this purpose. For instance, the Fatah II is a solid rocket missile specifically designed to, to strike Israel. Um, I, I think the Iranians have this problem set covered and um, they will, you know, they've proved, they made their point twice. In Operation True Promise 1, um, they saturated the air defense. They collected so much intelligence, it's beyond belief. Um, you know, the, the, how the aircraft operated, how the aircraft communicated, uh, how the air defense responded as different levels of threat penetrated deeper and deeper inside Israel. Uh, they were able to, to look at how, you know, the, the battle space was handed off from one, uh, you know, from the aircraft firing forward to forward air defense, to intermediate air defense, to final air defense. Um, the, the Iranians collected everything. Um, and they're very good at, at this collection. Um, and remember, they, Hezbollah is collecting intelligence and Iran is collecting that intelligence on behalf, you know, Hezbollah is collecting on behalf of Iran. And I think Iranian collectors are right there. Uh, Syria is collecting intelligence. Uh, the Russians are collecting intelligence. This is all being fed back to the Iranians. They had a full intelligence picture of what was going on, how the allies, uh, you know, Israel and, and their allied nations responded. And they've adapted to it. Operation True Promise 2 was a purely ballistic missile attack that you saw just saturated boom and it wasn't even the best missiles iran has this time around iran is going to be able to i mean the, the, it'll be devastating for the israelis what will happen if iran does attack in that or or israeli air defense arrow two three david slings patriots aegis sm3s I, the, the, they'll be able to intercept a handful of missiles they're not going to intercept any of the hypersonics and uh and once the system gets saturated, it's it's ineffective, and the Iranian missiles are going to be able to hit whatever targets they want to. In your opinion, if Israel decides to attack Iran, they're going to attack Iran by missiles together with fighter jets. How? What type? And do we know what type of missiles do they have to attack Iran? In terms of ballistic missiles, hypersonic, supersonic. The Israelis have um, the Jericho class missile that they use. They, that's their primary nuclear um, delivery vehicle. Um, I believe that it probably has been uh, configured with, um, you know, conventional uh, kinetic penetration warheads to, to, to hit hard targets, um, but probably also maybe some, um, you know, conventional explosives to take out leadership targets. Um, but there's, there's only so many that they have. They, they don't have thousands of them. They have scores of them. Maybe when they bring out in reserves, they might have a couple hundred of them. That's it. Uh, they also have uh, cruise missiles that can be fired from submarines. So they have uh, this, this German electric uh, submarine is very quiet. Um, oftentimes is operating in the Red Sea. Believe it can project itself into the uh, Arabian Sea, hover off the coast of Iran undetected, and fire missiles in that way. But then the primary strike vehicle for the Israelis will be aircraft, will be the F-35 or the F-15I um, uh, strike aircraft. Uh, your fighter protection will be with uh, F-22s and, um, and, and probably F-16s. Uh, maybe some of the F-16s will also be involved in in, in, in attacking, I don't know. Um, but that's their primary, I mean, but putting together a package like this, there's, there's, there's two scenarios that, that, that can be done. One is the stealth scenario. That is that you come in with a small number of aircraft uh, that seek to take a, use surprise and their stealth approach to penetrate rapidly, drop bombs and get the heck out. Uh, you get to do that one time. 
Um, and then you've got to go to the sustained strike package. And this means you're coming in with what we call during the Gulf War, the gorilla package. I mean, it's a big whole bunch of aircraft coming in. You have to put tankers in the air. You have to provide combat air protection for those tankers. Um, those tankers have to be rotated out because they themselves are operating away from their bases of operations. So basically, you got to put full-time gas station in the air. And then you've got to cycle airplanes in, get fueled up, and then go in and strike. And as they strike, you need, you know, it's not just the strike aircraft. You need electronic warfare aircraft. You need combat air patrol aircraft to protect against air. You need suppression of enemy air defense um, aircraft. And so, you know, you, you've got, you know, there's an air campaign being run that um, that is just that, a campaign. The initial strikes might be to suppress air defense. Then you have to come in and sweep the skies, and then you have to come in and you, um, you, you try to strike. This requires a lot of airplanes flying deep into Iran um, in a very exposed position. And uh, eventually, Iran will adapt to this. And uh, then now we have a, you know, a strategic air war being fought between Israel and Iran. And Israel, frankly speaking, can't sustain that because the casualties that will be accrued, both in terms of actual combat casualties. But remember, we're talking about aircraft like the F-35, uh, which is notorious in terms of the amount of hours needed to keep it flying. And if you start using the F-35 on, you know, in combat related, you know, the kind of tempo related to combat, uh, pretty soon your entire fleet's going to be down on the ground getting maintained. And now you're limited to what you can go. Everybody who's saying that Israel can do X, Y, and Z on the air, it's, there's a reason why Israel has come to the conclusion that it must have the United States, first of all, to protect the tankers. You're not going to be able to run those, uh, those gas stations over Iraqi airspace uh, without American protection. The Iranians will get them. They will shoot them down. Um, so now, how, so how do you even begin talking about a sustained air campaign against Iran uh, without American involvement? So if America is not going to be involved, you're basically talking about that, that one-time stealth attack, pop a couple targets and come out. Um, but that's a one-time trick. And here's the problem. If Iran lives up to its promise, you come in and you bomb. Uh, by the time your planes try to land at the airfield that they took off from, that airfield may lo no longer exist. Uh, because Iran's not coming in with 200 missiles next time. They're coming in with 1,000 to 2,000 missiles. Um, and that's a completely different ballgame. So uh, it, it's it's just not as easy as everybody thinks it's it's made out to be. And last time I talked with Ted Postal, he mentioned how Patriot system is successful against fighter jets. And what do we know about, because he said that against missiles, they're not that much successful as much as they're, they are against fighter jets. And because it's so easy for them to hit the target. And when it comes to the Russian system, S-300, 400, how, how do you evaluate these, these air defense systems? And how successful would they be in in attacking Israeli fighter jets? Well, there's, there's two things. One, um, Israel's plans have been predicated on S-300 type uh, air defense capabilities backed by indigenous Iranian capabilities um, with Iranian aircraft vectored in using Iranian uh, command and control capabilities. But if Russia, uh, you know, folds in its AWACS capabilities, uh, the advanced radar capabilities, the S-400, well, it's, I'm not saying that Israel can't come up with a solution to that. Look, the S-400 is not perfect. The Ukrainians have, um, you know, flown, uh, you know, the scalp missile in the in, in the storm shadow, you know, over S-400 sites and struck S-400 sites. So it's not the perfect weapon system. Um, but none of those attacks took place without extensive NATO intelligence involvement, meaning the Ukrainians didn't wake up in the morning and go, let's go bomb an S-400 site to take out the S-400 there were significant um, uh, inputs made by NATO and the United States uh, on, on facilitating that attack. Israel could receive those, those same inputs, but it's going to require them to redo their plan. One of the reasons why Israel may be waiting so long right now is that they have to redo their plans. And it's not just redoing the plans on paper. Their aircraft have to fly um, the, the profiles uh, to, to make sure that um, the pilots are ready for what's going on. They have to rehearse this. Um, and some of their rehearsals may include actual combat operations. For instance, uh, 
you know, some of the profiles that uh, Iran is flying uh, into Lebanon, into Syria, may incorporate some of the new tactics that uh, Israel may use against Iran without saying so. Um, but again, the Iranians and the Russians are on the alert for that. They're collecting the intelligence, they're factoring it in. So, you know, it, it, this this just complicates things. I'm not saying that the S-400 can't shoot down Iran, uh, Israeli aircraft. Uh, maybe they can. Um, you know, probably they can. Uh, but Israel, if Israel doesn't change its um, attack parameters uh, to incorporate this new capability, then that's definitely they will shoot down Israeli aircraft, including the F-35. So Israel has to reevaluate the total strike package. And now it, it complicates things because these tactics may require aircraft to fly, um, you know, terrain masking profiles for a longer distance. That burns up fuel, which means now you either have to uh, push tankers forward um, you know, to, to fuel off or you have to change aircraft. So you can't use planes that burn fuel. You have to swap them out for planes that, that can conserve fuel and you may lose some capacity there. You know, planning an air, air, air strike package like this is a very complicated thing. And um, the Russians providing the Iranians with S-400 uh, electronic warfare and S-35 aircraft with the potential of being backed up by, um, you know, the, uh, the, so the Russian AWACS aircraft, you know, that's, um, these are game changers. It doesn't mean game winners. It means game changers that Israel will have to change the way it's playing the game if it wants to succeed. And if you remember before the conflict in Ukraine started, we had the total, the, 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 the communication between is between Russia and the United States just stopped and nobody was talking with the United States in those days after failing to talk with Zelensky with and right now in the Middle East yesterday the foreign minister of Iran was talking about that they're not having any sort of communication with the United States because they don't see any sort of benefit coming out of these talks and do you think that how, how do you find the the situation right now, do you think it's still under the control? They can control it or it's getting out of the hand? It's totally out of control. Uh, there's no, there's no di diplomatic engagement. Um, you know, the, the United States, you know, you know, look, Biden just recently announced that he wanted to, you know, resume, um, you know, negotiations over arms control, the strategic nuclear forces arms control. Nobody's going to talk to him. He can't be trusted, first of all. The United States can't be trusted. We've lied from day one. We lie about everything. Um, and we still have a policy that says we want to strategically defeat Russia. Why would Russia agree to uh, negotiate away the one thing that guarantees it will never be strategically defeated, which is the strategic nuclear forces, uh, at a time when the United States still um, you know, actively embraces this policy? And even if the United States said, well, we changed the policy, we can't be trusted. We lie. Um, I just you know, want to tell your audience in 2009, 2010, when the new START treaty was being negotiated between the Obama administration and the, um, and, 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 uh, the Russian government, um, the Russians said that, um, look, we, we, we don't want to negotiate this, um, this treaty, um, your reduction in, in nuclear forces without, um, we have to factor in ballistic missile defense. We're very concerned that if we start lowering uh, the numbers of um, strategic nuclear forces we have, if you have missile defense, you're, we're going to run into a, a situation where you have the potential of shooting down more missiles than we have. And that's the end of our nuclear deterrence. And um, the Obama administration at the time um, promised, it was then President Medvedev, um, Look, we can't pass. We can't. We we might be able to get this strategic arms reduction treaty through Congress to get it ratified by the Senate, but if we roll in air defense, air, air missile defense, we can't get both of those passed. What we will do is, uh, if you if you do this, trust us. Trust us. The biggest words. And you know, never trust Americans when their lips are moving because they're lying. Um, trust us. We'll get this treaty done, and then we promise we'll turn to the issue of ballistic missile defense. Anatoly Antonov, who was former Russian ambassador to the United States, just left, um, was the lead negotiator at that time, and he prevailed upon Medvedev to uh, agree to this. And so they got the new treaty. The United States lied about that, too. I mean, we, we lied about everything. We, we negotiated in bad faith about 
you know how we do counting how you how you just um how do you pull the uh, launch capability out of a submarine um, or a B-52 bomber, uh, what we did is easily reversible and we bragged about it. We had generals before Congress saying, don't worry about those numbers because in a crisis, we can reverse them overnight and get our numbers up really quick. Uh, we built this treaty to achieve that. Do you see what I say? We built a treaty designed to reduce nuclear weapons so that we could trick the Russians in rapidly increasing the number of uh, deployed nuclear forces the, at any time. That's called negotiation in bad faith. But the worst part came after the treaty was ratified, passed through, et cetera, when uh, Anatoly Antonov picked up the phone and called Rose Goldmuller and said, okay, we're ready to uh, move on anti-ballistic missiles. The United States said, nah, we're, we're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. This isn't ancient history, ladies and gentlemen. This just happened. The Russians don't trust the United States. They don't trust anything the United States says. So they'll never, at this point in time, they're just not interested in entering into any of these negotiations. So there's no diplomacy there. Uh, with Iran, you know, there was a back channel taking place, apparently. The Iranians um, recently um, came out and made a statement that there was a back channel taking place through an intermediary, probably Gutter, uh, which historically has done this role. Um, they didn't get into what it was, but they said, we're, we're, we're done. There will be no more back channel, no more talk. Why? Well, because the United States, in carrying out this back channel, revealed that the Iranians had put on the table of uh, the possibility that they could absorb a limited Israeli strike and not retaliate. That's what the United States wanted. They wanted to bring this thing to an end. Now, the Iranians can't admit this in public because the whole idea of deterrence and everything is the, it's got to be believable. And so the Iranians are negotiating in secret with the United States to do something that is, you know, it's difficult for any nation to 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 do, to say we'll absorb a limited attack and we won't retaliate in order to bring this thing to an end. Then the United States leaks this. The Iranians, it's humiliating for them. They, you know, they've been, you know, they now have to explain to their people why this was. So they said, no more. We're done with the Americans. We can't trust you. You're liars. Uh, you can't be trusted. There's no diplomacy. So whatever hope we had with working back channels with the Iranians to, you know, mitigate a potential wider war is done because America, once again, can't be trusted. Right now, Russian fighters are attacking some targets in Idlib and Aleppo and in those regions, which re recently we've learned that the United States is providing them with weapons. And they're talking about that Turkey is behind these people as well. But right now that Russia is attacking them, in terms, it, it's a preemptive attack, if I'm not mistaken. Is that the case, Scott? Russia's been attacking them for some time now. You're talking about in Idlib. You're talking about the Islamists. Um, uh, Russia's been attacking them for some time now. The the the, the intensity of the attacks is increasing. Um, you know, and this may be in preparation for um, maybe a joint um, offensive operation between Russia, Syria, and Turkey to eliminate this problem because this is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, a huge problem for, um, you know, for, for regional security, this, this Wahhabist Al Qaeda literal, um, enclave, um, that Turkey built, uh, but Turkey can't control right now. It's, um, and, and as long as it's there, it'll be impossible for the millions of refugees who are from Syria who are in Turkey to come home. Uh, Erdogan has a huge political problem. He needs to get these refugees out of Turkey, and he can't do that until Syria is stabilized, uh, to you know, politically stabilized, and that can't happen until Idlib is 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 cleansed. So um, I think you're you're starting to see the end game for these Islamists. And the Turkish government is attacking the Kurdish community, and which we know that the, the United States is providing them with weapons. What a complex situation, Scott, we're witnessing right now in the Middle East. It's in the United States, in Syria, with these Kurdish people against Turkey. And do can we understand what would be the, the end game of the United States in the Middle East, considering all these activities? Well, the end game of the United States is clear. Um, instability, chaos friction, violence, um, the perpetual war 
that exists in the Middle East um, is good for American business. Uh, you know, we, we're able to sell weapons. Um, we're able to prevent our opponents from consolidating power and influence. Um, this is what we do best. The last thing we want is peace and stability to break out because the reality is if peace and stability breaks out, um, you know, Mother Nature dictates that you're going to have a better relations with people closer to you than you are to people far away from you because the day-to-day -day interface is con consistent. America will be at a strategic disadvantage. The only way that we can insert ourselves into this region is to make ourselves relevant. Um, and we make ourselves, we have opted to make ourselves relevant through military force. Um, that is the, that is the go-to agency for the United States on how we deal with the world, the use of military force. I've likened, uh, what America is doing to, um, the sort of, I call it the American Midas touch, um, you know, because America believes because we are the exceptional nation, we are the indispensable nation that everything we touch is gold and that it somehow benefits us. So we, we touch a reason we get a war, we sell weapons, that's gold. Um, we, we, we touch another region, drive threats out, take over, have neo-colonial economic exploitation. Just think cobalt in Congo. People Google it. You'll know what I'm talking about. We need the cobalt. We need it for our cell phones and all our little electronics in the Congo. In order to get the cobalt out of the Congo, we need a civil war that's been going on now for, for decades uh, that's killed millions of people that nobody talks about uh, and has it causes millions of uh, small children to work in these uh, mines under horrific conditions, poisoning their bodies, limiting their lifespan, just so that we all can have the convenience of having a cell phone. Um, you know, this is what America does. Uh, touch it, gold, gold for us. But the problem is, if you look at the Midas uh, story, King Midas, you know, he, he was, this was a curse. Because yes, everything he touched was the gold. But then he got hungry and they handed him an apple. And he touched the apple and he couldn't eat it because it's gold. He tried to drink water, couldn't, turn to gold. Um, his daughter came to him and, uh, you know, asked why he's so unhappy. And uh, he touched her. She died. She turned to gold. And that's how King Midas ended up dying, starved alone, because the, the Midas touch was a curse. And the American Midas touch is a curse. Everything we touch dies. I'll challenge anybody to come up with and uh, show me where this isn't the case. We touched Iraq, millions of dead. You know, we've touched Ukraine, hundreds of thousands of dead. Syria, hundreds of thousands of dead, if not more. Uh, Somalia, whatever we touch dies. We've done nothing good, especially since the end of the Cold War. Erdogan just today said that the way that the United States, the, the Israelis are behaving in the Middle East right now, we cannot call them a state because there is no country in the, in the UN that cannot define its borders. It's the only country on this planet without defining its borders. How in 1948, when they have decided to put out a state of Israel, just recognizing this country, one of the conditions was to, to accept a Palestinian state, Scott. And what is the, and, and, and on the other hand, Erdogan is asking to boycott Israel, to put tremendous sanctions and, so forth and so on. How do you find it right now, the situation? And do you think with these new talks on the part of Erdogan, maybe Arab states together with Iran, all together, Europeans are talking about this right now. And they're getting more serious about the conditions as we talk in, in at the beginning of this talk, the Biden administration finally is talking about it at least. And how, how, how do you see the situation with Israelis and why we cannot pressure them to at least define their borders? Because to get Israel to define their borders, honestly, uh, would require Israel to admit that it um, has no desire to abide by international law because the borders as defined by Israel isn't just about eliminating the Palestinian state. Um, once you allow that to happen, once you buy into the notion that, um, you know, Israel has a, 
you know, historical right to greater Israel, um, understand that the Israelis don't self-limit to the Palestinian territory. They're talking about expanding up to the Euphrates, to the Nile, uh, and, 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 and they view greater Israel in, in biblical terms. Uh, and, you know, this is why Israel won't commit openly to these borders, because Israel has become this, um, this a, a nation that is not governed by the laws of man but rather governed by um, what the Israelis claim to be the law of God. Um, and remember, the Israelis, uh, the, the Jews view themselves as the chosen people, that they are God's chosen. And when you get into uh, you know, the, the, the Talmud, uh, which is basically the interpretation of the Torah by um, you know, ancient uh, Hebrew scholars that have become basically the go-to text for rabbis to talk about, you know, how, how to translate what, what took place in the, in the Torah and the Bible to life. Um, there are some very extreme um, Talmudic uh, texts that uh, speak of goyim. People like me, I don't know your religious background. I don't care. It's your business. But if you're not Jewish, you're goy and um, you're an animal. And then and we can go on there. It just devolves into murder, rape, um, all the things that they're allowed to do the goy because the goy aren't human uh, we're, we don't count um and when you nor, under normal circumstances this kind of extreme interpretation of religious text would be um you know left to a you know a minority of people who because of civil society wouldn't be able to give voice to this uh look i can go into the christian bible and uh, pull out things that uh, have been used to justify mass murder over the years. Uh, people can go to the Islamic text of the Quran and do the same thing. It's, there's no religion that's immune to this. But um, what happened when, um, for instance, ISIS created the caliphate uh, in Syria and Iraq and, um, and, and, and chose to define Islam in the most extreme uh, manner. The, the the Islamic world turned against it and said, no, that's not what Islam is. That's what you say Islam is, but Islam isn't that. Islam is an, you know, a, a religion that uh, promotes peace as opposed to uh, the terror that you talk about. We don't promote murder. We, you know, we, we do this. Uh, the same thing with Christians. You know, you know, by and large, the Christian faith is, is saying we believe in nonviolence, even though <laughs> historically we know that that hasn't always been the case. But um, you know, and, and Jews, you know, in the United States, you know, there was a time you could go to a synagogue and you were dealing with people of peace, they uh, peaceful coexistence, getting along. Um, there, there was a time when you could have, you know, intercongregational meetings with Jews and Christians, not so much Muslims, because we've always been prejudiced against Muslims, but, you know, you, you should be able to come together and, 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 and talk about these things. But now the synagogues have become, because of this conflict, have become, you know, festering cesspools of um, Jewish-centric, um, you know, fanaticism um, that speaks about defending Israel at all costs, that puts Israel ahead of the United States, uh, that speaks about a greater Israel and the need to pursue a greater Israel, uh, which condemns the Palestinians and doesn't promote peaceful coexistence with the Palestinians. This is what the Jewish faith has become at this point in time. Not all of them, of course not. Uh, not even the majority of them, but a very vocal, increasing minority that has seized control of Israel itself. We have to understand that Israel is firmly in control, uh, under the control of people who promote greater Israel, who view Palestinians as animals, who have said this and said it publicly. Israel today, as it exists, is incompatible with civilized life. It's incompatible with the rule of law. It's incompatible with the United Nations. The United Nations, which gave it life, Israel is turning on it like a cancer, seeking to bring it down. Israel is turning on everybody. This is what happens when a cancer gets into the final stages. Uh, it kills everything in order to keep itself alive. It will kill the host body to keep itself alive. That's what Israel is doing right now. It's a cancer, a tumor that must be excised if the region and the world is going to survive. Israel, as it's currently configured, cannot be allowed to exist. It has lost the right to exist. You don't get to do what Israel's doing. Total disregard for the law. Anytime a people say that we are more important than everybody else, that we everybody else has to yield to our desire. Look, America's been saying that for some time now, and the world's turning on America. Israel ain't America. 
It's a tiny little country, tiny little country that's acting as if it has some sort of moral right to impose its will on the world, dictating to the United Nations that gave it life, dictating to the Palestinians, dictating to the Lebanese, and now dictating to America. The one thing they cannot live without is America, and they're starting to try and dictate to us. Um, what the end game is going to be, I don't know. Uh, but I can say this, that Israel as it currently exists with this mindset, this political mindset, uh, this ultra-Zionism, um, it, it will self-destruct because it's an unsustainable ideology and the uh, methodologies that they're using to keep themselves alive as a nation are incompatible with uh, international humanity, international law. You know, I, I, was, I, I watched a video, uh, I think it dates back to 1992, and there was a, um, a Holocaust survivor, a professor who had just won, I think, the Israel Prize. And he was being chastised by some right-wing Israeli uh, politicians and academics uh, because he had compared, um, you know, uh, Zionists, Jewish Zionists to Nazis. And they, they were chastising him. How dare you do this? Do you? And, they, and the guy was hammering, do you believe that Jews are, are Nazis? And he said, there are elements within Israel uh, that have embraced the ideology of the Nazis. And then he said, so they, they you know, have the, have the Israelis killed 6 million? Have we burned 6 million, put them up the crematorium? Have we done this? Have we done this? Have we done this? And the guy kept saying, Israel has created these concentration camps. So the one guy conceded that Israel had created concentration camps, but he said, you can't call us Nazis because we haven't burned them in the ovens yet. And the last thing the guy said, as he pointed to him, he said, that's your prophecy. That's your prophecy. Meaning that, you know, before the, before the crematorium came the concentration camps, Germany built concentration camps before they built crematorium. Israel built concentration camps before they decided to burn the Palestinians to death. And we saw Israel literally burn a Palestinian family to death, alive, in front of everybody, for the whole world to see. What's the world doing about it? Not a damn thing. Yeah. Scott, right now in the United States, right and left, the Biden administration is putting out statements talking about that if Iran tries to harm Trump, they're going to, it's an act of war. It, it's it's so ridiculous, unbelievable right now, because the Iranian officials in New York, they gave tons of interviews to the mainstream media talking about these accusations that they're not interested in killing Trump or assassinating Trump or anything with Trump. And because the at the end of the day, the foreign policy of the United States doesn't that much change. That doesn't change when it comes to Iran. Doesn't matter if it's a Republican, Democrat. They're having the same type of policy interactions with Iran. What would Iran be interested in assassinating Donald Trump or harming Donald Trump to help? I don't know to help whatever it is in their mind. Look, there's an element within Iran that definitely um, would like to see revenge against Donald Trump for the crime of assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, Iran hasn't forgotten about that crime. But the leadership, the Iranian leadership, which would have to order this, um, is a leadership that looks strategically. And, um, you know, uh, uh, doing something like that um, would trigger a response, a potential of full scale war that why Iran doesn't need it. There's no strategic advantage to doing this. Uh, and, it, you know, Iran is not the kind of nation that uh, is going to commit national suicide just to say, oh, we got an act of revenge here. Um, you know, the Iranians have said that, you know, one day the United States will pay a price and that day may come, but not right now. There's too much at stake here. Um, you know, Iran doesn't want the United States to join in with Israel to attack it. So why would it give the United States any, um, you know, any any reason to do this? Uh, Iran wants to, um, you know, be thoroughly integrated into BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization because that's the path towards their future economic, um, you know, revival. Uh, why would they want to undo that through a, a silly act of revenge? Uh, 
They're not trying to, I'll just make it clear as day. Iran is not trying to kill the president of the United States. And we know it too. Um, it turns out that, um, you know, one of the um, intelligence threads that was used by uh, Averill Haynes when she briefed Donald Trump about the Iranian threat was an FBI setup where the FBI created um, the, 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 the Iranian threat and, and, and was trying to lure somebody in believing that he would be facilitating it. But, you know, that's, that's like uh, me saying that uh, Al Qaeda is trying to, the FBI has done this before. Al Qaeda is trying to shoot down American airliners. So we go to, you know, Poughkeepsie, New York, and we go out in front of a mosque and we say, Hey, who wants to do, you know, get back at America, the evil Americans. And somebody comes in, we say, Hey, what do you think? You want to shoot down an airplane? I don't know. I mean, could we do that? Yeah, I can. I got a missile launcher here. I don't know. Should we? Yeah, I could order the missile launcher for you. Oh, all right. Well, why don't you order it? You're under arrest for trying to organize an Al Qaeda attempt to shoot down airplanes. I had no intention of shooting down airplanes. It's totally an FBI fabrication. And I would say that almost every aspect of this so-called Iranian threat against Donald Trump is an FBI fabrication. Um, there's nothing real to it. And I, I, I can't, you know, I can't say that I've seen the intelligence. I haven't. I've seen things there, but. Again, I used to be part of that game, <laughs> you know, at a pretty good level. And I know how that game is played. And the game hasn't changed. And so the U.S. intelligence community is not about trying to secure the national security interests of the United States. The U.S. intelligence community has been thoroughly corrupted by politicization. And their job is to advance the political interests of the powers that are in or namely speaking, the establishment. Donald Trump is not of the establishment. And so the intelligence community is designed to uh, disrupt Donald Trump, to interfere with Donald Trump, to, um, to, to, to you create uh, problems for Donald Trump. If you think that this, you know, what did Donald Trump say a week before this? A week before this, and a lot of Americans didn't pick up on it, but he said, um, the sanctions against Iran is stupid. He said, you know, I, I, I put sanctions on when I was president, but I take them off. And he said, right now, we should be in the business of taking the sanctions off of Iran uh, so that we can pursue stability in the region. And suddenly, Iran wants to assassinate Donald Trump. Cause and effect relationship, ladies and gentlemen. The intelligence community, the establishment, the Biden administration couldn't allow Donald Trump to further that line of thinking. And so suddenly we have an Iranian assassination attempt against the president that simply doesn't exist. And the other thing that we can witness from the behavior of Iranians, Hezbollah, Houthis, even with Israel, which they consider as enemy, they don't kill, they don't kill civilians. They didn't attack civilian infrastructures. They attacked the air bases, the military bases, and with the with the assassination of. Say, Nasrallah, Ismail Haniyeh, we didn't see any sort of these attacks coming to the civilian parts of Israel. No, I mean, um, you can criticize Hezbollah all you want, you criticize Hamas. I mean, Hamas used to be criticized because, rightfully so, I mean, I was in Israel from 1994 and 1998, and every time I visited, every time without exception, there was a Hamas terrorist attack that killed Israeli civilians. Um, Hamas was targeting Israeli civilians as part of a a broader strategy of um, undermining uh, support for Yitzhak Rabin's, um, you know, embrace of the Oslo Accords. Um, but you know, Hezbollah and um, and and Iran, you know, they seriously incorporate the teachings of of Islam. I mean, when you have when you're a theocratic institution, um, and you you base uh, your justification for existing on uh, your adherence to uh, your religion, in this case, Islam, um, when the teachings of, you know, uh, Muhammad, uh, the prophet Muhammad, you know, it, it's specifically says you will not kill innocent women and children. This is not what you do. We don't hit the innocents. That's against Islam that, you know, we will kill those people who, you know, who fight us, um, you know, but we don't attack women and children. They factor this into their reality. Um, this is their approach. Look at look at Iran. They the, the both strikes, you know that you had, uh, you know I think one civilian tragically die when a uh, when a booster landed on them in uh, Jericho, and uh, another one may have died elsewhere. Uh, but it wasn't deliberate targeting. Um, 
the Iranians went out of their way not to target civilians. Hezbollah has not been in the business of killing Israeli civilians. They are in the business of killing the Israeli military and destroying military targets. Uh, the Israelis believe in collective punishment. That's what they're doing in Gaza. That's what they're doing in Beirut, where they are punishing the civilians for the sins of, you know, or the alleged sins, depending on your point of view, of um, Hamas and Hezbollah. Um, so when Israel says we're the most moral army, it's a joke. It's a lie. Israel is the most immoral army imaginable on every level. Uh, they deliberately assassinate children. Their snipers are trained to take out children, take out mothers. They don't care because they view these people as animals. Uh, they believe in the collective punishment uh, because they, they say that if we uh, kill enough civilians, the civilians will turn on uh, the source of the violence, which isn't us, but Hezbollah and Hamas. That has never worked. It hasn't worked in Gaza. It's not going to work in Lebanon. It didn't work in Lebanon in 2006. It won't work in Lebanon today. But the end result, though, is still tens of thousands, in this case, perhaps hundreds of thousands, and if it continues, millions of civilians dying uh, at the hands of this unlawful, rogue, terrorist, genocidal state called Israel. And the other thing would be the situation with UNIFIL in Lebanon. And Netanyahu is asking them to get out of Lebanon. And on the other hand, they are insisting to be in Lebanon and they, he said, Netanyahu said that they didn't attack Unifil. And who, who's, why he's trying to do this, and why does he need Unifil to leave Lebanon? I mean, Unifil, you know, occupies a, a very strategic, um, you know, space in Lebanon, uh, southern Lebanon, south of the Latani River. Um, Israel would like freedom of operation. Um, Unifil is, you know, prevents that freedom of operation. Uh, Unifil also provides inconvenient eyes that can see the crimes of Israel. Um, and you know what? It, it's interesting to hear, you know, Israel talk about, you know, well, Hamas or Hezbollah operates, you know, uh, in, in southern Lebanon, and Unifil doesn't do anything to to stop them. Um, here, Israel is invaded. Lebanon invaded without any legal authority. It's a, it's a gross violation of international law. Um, and Hezbollah is defending itself. Unifil isn't going to be in the business of preventing Hezbollah from defending uh, Lebanese soil. And defense can take the form of retaliation against, uh, against Israel by striking in Israel. So it's a total misread of the reality by by Israel about you know, but the, the Israel has been attacking Unifil for years. Uh, if you go back into the 1990s, um, you remember there was the, 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 the infamous case, uh, where Naftali Bennett, uh, was the head of, I think, a Magalan commando unit, uh, operating in the rear, hunting down, uh, Hezbollah mortar operators when they came under fire. And, uh, in order to get withdrawn, they had to put down artillery fire on the people that had uh, compromised his position. He panicked. And uh, basically, he ordered uh, strikes to take place against refugees who had fled into a Unifil camp or were in a Unifil bunker, and the artillery hit that and killed dozens of them, including some Unifil soldiers. Uh, Israel denied it, lied about it, and later on said, oh, it was an accident. It wasn't anything accidental about it. If you read the final report, it says it was deliberate targeting by Israel. Uh, Israel doesn't make too many accidents. Um, you know, I had... Um, back again in the 90s when we were talking about bringing in drones to incorporate into uh, the um, UN weapons inspection uh, capability so that you know we could fly drones over Iraq and monitor um, looking for movement of weapons of mass destruction, uh, potential things of that nature. Um, I went to Israel and was given a tour of uh, one of their major drone bases that operated inside of, you know, operated drones over Lebanon. And so I was able to go in and watch the launch, watch the operation, watch uh, what they're having, and talk to them about, you know, drone operations at large. Um, there's no accidents. Uh, everything Israel done is done over, you know, positive control, overwatch. Um, you know, there's panic. The Israelis aren't as good as everybody leads them to believe, including their so-called elite special forces. Uh, you know, they, they tend to scream like stuck pigs when they get shot. They get shot off, and because they're fighting forces that, uh, you know, aren't defenseless, uh, civilians in the West Bank or in Gaza. These are hardened uh, Hezbollah fighters who are resisting. Um, but, you know, the drones see everything and every everything is directed. There's decisions that are made. The Israelis, what they're very good at is lying. 
They are you know, consummate liars. They lie about everything. They don't tell the truth about anything. Um, and that's that's the reality of it. Do you think if Israel continues with this attitude in the Middle East, are we going to see some sort of joint operation, maybe Iran and Turkey, Turkey together against Israel? And that would be a game changer in terms of what the United States is trying to do in the Middle East. Because Turkey is part of NATO. That would be interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, Turkey and Iran um, are capable of having that, um, that level of cooperation. The only reason why I bring that up is that uh, Turkey is a major supporter of Azerbaijan and Iran right now you know, is supporting Armenia and, uh, you know, and, and tensions that exist in the Southern Caucasus. And Iran has threatened uh, that if um, Azerbaijan were to take certain actions against Armenia, um, I think it's the Lechon Corridor or something of that nature, that they would intervene and then Turkey would come in and now you'd have a regional conflict between Iran and Turkey. Um, you know, can they bury that hatchet and move on? I, I don't know. I think Iran, you know, I think what can happen is that there can be a um, Iranian component, and then independent of Iran, Turkey could intervene. But Turkey's not there yet. There's a lot of rhetoric taking place on the part of Turkey, uh, but they're not they're not ready to commit. And I don't think the region's ready to commit for Turkey to physically intervene. They'd have to come through uh, Syria, um, that requires you know solving the Idlib problem. That requires solving the Kurdistan you know the Kurdish problem. Um, we still doing then, right now. Well, they're 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 trying, but that you know it's not as easy as uh, as people think. Um, and then there's the United States and NATO problem. I mean, what happens if Turkey decides that uh, it would go against Israel? Um, how does the United States and NATO deal with that? The um, United States is a NATO ally. Does the United States militarily intervene and attack Turkey? And if the United States attack Turkey, does Article Five <laughs> kick in? What does Russia do? Uh, if the United States attacks Turkey and Turkey suddenly says, screw it, we're not NATO, we're activating a, a relationship with the Russians and the Iranians, and now we have a whole different thing. You know, it's all fantasy. This is stuff that uh, you know plays out in academia, but I think Turkey's so far removed from the potential of launching a military strike against Israel, it's not even worth talking about at this point in time. 